is, would you rather have no arms or no legs? I would rather have um, no legs because uh, there's a lot of things that I can do with. I mean, I spend most of my day sitting anyway. So I feel like, you know, legs are optional, arms, not so much. I mean, I could even, you know, I could even, I could even lift weights without legs. I think I'd be good. You know, obviously I like my legs. I'd like to keep them, but if I had to pick, that's what I would do. There's a lot of gym bros out there that would happily get rid of legs, I think, so they don't have to do like leg day, you know. I, know I do a- legs three days a week. I squat twice and deadlift once. Nice. I do exactly the same, actually. I do, uh, I do the split squats on one of those days and I, do- I do back squat on one day front squat the other day and deadlift the other day nice nice i've recently got into more fitness stuff so anyone listening to the podcast probably fed up of me <laughs> talking yeah. about it. like why is he not talking about front squats stuff? are the way they're the best they're also horrible and i hate doing them but uh pound for pound bang for your buck front squats are the best exercise in my opinion yeah 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 i am um, I found it's squats are the main thing where they're the only exercise I do where if I really push the weight and I put the weight down, I, I can feel a bit like lightheaded at the end. I'm like, oh, okay, that was it's a good sign. Know. Yeah, it's obviously working. You can tell, I feel the heart rate really go up, whereas yeah. it's just like yeah. a more of an isolation thing. And it feels so. So if I haven't had my breakfast that morning, it's a, it's, it's a difficult, difficult task. Yeah, don't pass out and bonk your head on the on the weights yeah that's the thing i'm on my own as well so i'm like i'm trying to keep it sensible um but in terms of like your life i mean obviously you know things like working out as part of getting a sort of balanced life how do you do you feel like you have a balance in what you do um you know just day to day um i mean it's hard to know i mean everyone's idea of balance is different for me i don't have hobbies or interests so i gave up all that a long time ago. So basically, you know, my job is to provide for my family, meaning I got to pay the bills and I also need to, you know, be present and like spend quality time with them. So those are the only two things that matter and everything else is out the window. Uh, So It's hard, you know, in the moment, it's hard, you know, it's tough, especially now that we have a baby and stuff. Um, It's, it's hard. I mean, like, you know, this morning, my kid is crying and needs me to feed him. People are also blowing me up on Slack about bugs on our website. And, you know, I'm also hungry. um, And it's 4.15 a.m., you know, Um, where's the balance in that? It doesn't exist. But I think... um, Here's what I think. This is going to be an unpopular answer, but I think people, if you want to do something extraordinary with your life, it's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be easy. And there's going to be lots of times where it sucks. But as they say, do what other people won't for years so you can spend the rest of your life doing what other people can't. And that is my plan is to grind hard now and make as much money as I can so that in a couple of years, I can tell everyone to fuck off. And not necessarily, I'm not going to be like so rich that I don't have to work, but we'll have enough money that like we're, we're good to just work sort of as much as we want and not have to, you know, grind forever. So I just think you got to give this idea of balance. I think it's stupid. Like if you want to do something extraordinary anyway, now, if you just want to be a normal person having a nine to five job, which by the way, I think is a very good goal. Like, I think that's probably right for most people. Like, but if you want to, it's like, if you want to be like, you know, a full-time musician or have a great career as a designer or something like that, it's not going to be fucking easy because guess what? Everybody wants to do that too. And if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Or if you want like, you know, if you ask a pro athlete, for example, where the balance is in their life, they'll laugh at you. It doesn't fucking exist because all they do is fucking eat, sleep and train. So, you know, the right answer for everybody is different, but I, I just, I find it kind of, kind of irritating to me that people think they can have some kind of extraordinary life and achieve extraordinary things while also having balance in their life. Like, why would that be the case? Why do you think you can have an amazing life and also a chill life, like do amazing things and have a chill life? Why would you think those two things are compatible? Hmm. I suppose balance implies having sort of um, one sort of almost two sides of a scale. And it's like, well, how, what, you know, if on the one side you have work, 
if you're balancing that out with a healthy mindset that allows you to work as much as you want and you enjoy the process, you know, why does the thing on the other side of the scale have to be getting drunk or playing Xbox or whatever? You know what I mean? I'm not I'm not shitting on people for just enjoying yeah, yeah, themselves. Yeah. No, I mean, look, you know. everyone should do what they want. I don't, if you want to get drunk and play Xbox, that's fine with me. Um, my issue is that um, there's lots of times where um, our ambitions do not match our actions. That's my point. You know, like if you're saying... For example, a lot of people I talk to, you know, want to be a full-time musician and a successful one. Well, are you doing what it takes to get there or not? You know, so do I have balance in my life? No, but I'm okay with that because I accept, you know, that what I want to do is have some amount of economic freedom, you know, within the next couple of years. And I'm going to have to eat some shit along the way to get there. And I'm okay with that. Yeah, I know I've certainly felt uneasy at times in the last sort of, uh, sort of, it's hard to say how long, um, but I was in a band for a while and that was doing well. I feel like we were going the right way, you know, and then I sort of chose to leave that. It just wasn't working for me. Um, yeah. And uh, I, actually, I won't, I won't shit on them, but I think people, you yeah, know, we didn't shit work. Shit on them. They deserve it. Uh, no, but I suppose I my, know. my, my criticism of, of not all of them, but some would be that that we're talking about balance and I think um, they perhaps were too keen on balance as they suppose is a nice way to put it Um, you know given what we've just talked about Um, but I found the times I feel the most uneasy with myself is when I'm not putting the time in it's a very weird cycle and I don't know if you've got any advice for getting out of it for not just for me but for anyone where I find the more the less I do to work towards the things I really want to do the more I feel the need to sort of almost medicate with like going out or, you know, um, watching a YouTube, watching a movie or watching a YouTube video. Which because, just makes it worse. Yeah, you end up in, it's not even procrastination. I don't even think that's the right word. And it's, I feel like almost medicating is the right thing where you, yeah. it's the right term where I think I'm not where I want to be. And I know the best thing for me right now is probably to write a song or or plan a pod, you know, sort of podcast. Whatever, or, yeah. Um, and then but because you're not necessarily in the best mood, because you're not where you want to be, you then have to, you feel the need to fix that immediately, that mood, that mood that you're not happy with. Because it feels like it's a very immediate threat almost, you know, going yeah. into sort of evolutionary stuff. Not that I'm the slightest bit educated in that. Um, what do you think beyond just saying, beyond the sort of just do it kind of slogan, you know, I'm not saying that that's what you're doing, but like, you know, there's some people would just kind of give that advice. Is there anything, is there like a mindset or something that you could tap into? Or is it as simple as just saying like, just get get at it kind of thing to get out of that mindset? Yeah, I think it's that simple. Um, at least for me, um, I forget if, I don't remember if it's, uh, <clears throat> I don't remember if it's Bruce Lee or um, some other Jeet Kune Do guy, <clears throat> but I remember my, my the first MMA gym that I trained at years ago had this poster on the wall. Uh, which was action is the route to self-esteem. And that really stuck with me. Like if you're feeling conflicted because the little voice in your head is like, you've said that you want to do this thing, but you're not working towards the thing. This feels bad. And you're taking yourself off the path, you know, with the other stuff you've talked about, like, you know, fucking around watching YouTube or Xbox or jerking off or whatever it is that you want to do. It feels bad because you you know that you're you've been taken off the path and that doesn't feel good. So action is the route to self esteem. Like do the thing you know you're supposed to do and then you'll feel better. Mm, I think it's um, Insta- you will feel better instantly. I guarantee it. Yeah, it, there's definitely. I feel there's a culture of um, sort of patchworking your way back to feeling all right. Yeah, and completely sort of. Um, uh, what's the word like just completely basically avoiding the responsibility that you, that you kind of yeah. owe to yourself in some way it's not like you owe it to someone else you know i don't know listen anyone, you're not really. disappointed nobody else gives a shit whether you achieve your goals or not hmm. they don't care yeah. the only person you're disappointing letting down is yourself yeah have you was there um have you always had this kind of mindset or is it was there something that switched in you that made you think this way or was it a gradual process what where have you been on that um, sort of i think i was i think i was born this way i don't know enough about like psychology and trait theory to like tell you you know sort of to have a framework for what this is well i sort of do but um 
Yeah, I was born this way. And and that's what I was going to say is I think a lot of creative people like just are not wired that way. Um, they're not wired the same way. I mean, like my dad was in the Navy and he was a corrections officer after that. And I think, you know, he like I, I guess I get a lot of this from him. Like he would talk about when he was, uh, you know, when he was a corrections officer, he became a counselor later on in his career, which is the person that the inmates go to like a guidance counselor. But it's not really like sit down and tell me about your feelings. It's more like, OK, let's check in. You have a parole hearing in six months. If that goes well, you know, maybe you'll be able to get out early. Um, here's what you need to do if you want that parole hearing to go well. Like you need to take this anger management class and this job training program and make sure you don't get in any trouble again for this, this, and this, and and then you'll have your best chances. And the inmates sometimes would listen, and other times they'd be like, "Fuck you! You can't tell me what to do." And he's like, "All right, like I don't like I don't care whether you get paroled or not. I'm just telling you, if you want to get paroled, this is what you need to do." So that idea of basically being accountable for your choices, I think, was. I mean, he never sat me down and told me that. But it just became obvious to me, I think, from like his work and also seeing my parents' friends were all a bunch of fuck up hippies and stuff that would always take the fucking easy way out. And I see where that got them, you know, like if they didn't if they didn't like their job, they would just quit. Or, you know, if uh, whatever they didn't they weren't happy with their situation rather than try to improve it, they would just go party. You know, just take the easy way out again and again and again. And then I saw as they got older where that got them. And, you know, they're not <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> Life did not turn out well for the vast majority of them. Hmm. So uh, nobody ever told me this. And I think part of it is just being born this way. But, you know, taking the easy way out, like it's just not the way it doesn't work. You know? Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for the. uh also having those kind of negative role models. I can't remember who I heard talking about it, but that, that, you know, you don't always have to have someone to look up to. You can have loads of people that you don't want to be like, you go, okay, I don't want to do this. And sure, then, yeah. You know, and then, um, so my, my dad and, um, and my stepmom, his, the person he's married to now, both of them worked at this prison. And, you know, that's not, as you can imagine, that's not, it's not the most chill job in the world. You know, I mean, like they liked it, but they're, you know, they both worked there for like 20, 25 years, locked up in a fucking cage with rapists and murderers and stuff all day. Um, but they showed up every day and they retired after whatever, 20, 25 years. And they're good. They've got their state benefits and everything. They just, you know, have a chill, normal life, nothing to worry about. Meanwhile, the people who took the easy way out earlier you know, are scrambling and wondering what the fuck they're going to do, except they're 70 years old now. And when you're 70 years old, it's a little bit too late to be course correcting, you know? So when I see people who are in their 20s or certainly in their 30s, I, I guess in your 20s, it's sort of understandable if you're kind of spinning your wheels a little bit. Um, but certainly but people that are in their 30s kind of fucking around and spinning their wheels and making excuses and stuff, it's like, I don't know what you think is going to happen here. Like people have this idea like, oh, well, everything's going to work out. Why would everything work out? Like by what mechanism is everything going to work out? Why do you think everything is going to be OK? Because I've been around a lot of fucking people where everything did not turn out OK. Yeah, it's 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 um, I think it's that thing where a lot of people. I'm guilty, but I'm sure I'm, I'm sure you've done it. Everyone's done it. Where you kind of you feel like you're the center of the universe, you know, and you feel like something's going to stop, you know, um, uh, like sort of intervene and and. No, and I feel the, the exact movies. opposite. Yeah, I feel like if I don't give everything I have, um, I'm going to get crushed under the wheel of the universe unless I stop it from happening. Do you feel like that pressure, I'm not trying to get all sort of therapy on you, but do you feel like that sort of pressure on yourself, obviously it's got a lot of quite obvious positive um, sort of externalities in terms of what it allows you to do with your career and, and I suppose therefore with your life, but there's it's obviously a kind of a carrot and a stick thing. Oh, of course. Yeah, um, of course. Are there any sort of drawbacks? I can I can tell that you're certainly not, so, um, by talking about the drawbacks, I know that it's... Uh, I think you've already kind of made a, a good case for why the mindset you're discussing is, is a good yeah. thing. 
But are there drawbacks that if someone wants to kind of, con- it really wants to turn things around and be a bit more or a lot more productive towards where they want to be, yeah. are there pitfalls to think about in terms of whether it be like, I don't know, putting too much pressure on yourself or, or yeah. what kind of pitfalls? Uh, there are, but how many people would you say you have ever known where you think the problem is that they put too much pressure on themselves and they work too hard? How many people would you say you've known like that? I, it's a good question because I know. Versus how many people have you known that don't work hard enough? So I would, I see what you're saying. I have a few friends where, so for example, I went to, I went to a really good school um, here in the UK and a lot of my friends now are in like very high paying jobs, you know, yeah. um, and they work really hard. They work a lot, like 12 hour days or more. Yeah. If not, sometimes they're just waking up work and go home and then yeah. go to bed and then, and repeat. And, um, I can see them sort of enjoying the grind of it, but, um, you know, I've already got friends who are in that sort of position where they're already actually thinking, I think I want to do something different now or, yeah. um, and they've only been, so I'm 25, right? They've yeah. been out of uni, bear in mind, they're obviously working all the way through uni. They've been out of uni for maybe like three or four years and they're already kind of thinking like, um, something's not quite right, whatever that is. Yeah. So I would say well, that, maybe- That's fair. Yeah. That, okay. So that's fair. Um, for those people, yeah, maybe maybe they do need to like chill a little bit. Maybe there are people, you know, that have been basically nose to the grindstone since they were like kids, you know, trying to get into this great school and then it's a hard school and then they get a great job. That's also really challenging. And for those people, yeah, maybe maybe it is like, do you really enjoy this? Like, is this actually making you happy or should you chill? Um, so if that's the case, then fair enough. Um because I have interfaced with so many creative type people, um, it's very rare for me to run into people like that. Although, you know, like my wife worked for Amazon for like six years and there's a lot of those people where it's like, dude, you're rich. You don't need to work this hard. Why are you still doing this? You know, like if you're a, a director at Amazon and you've been there for 15 years, you don't have to work for the rest of your life. You know, you've got millions and millions of dollars in savings and, RSUs, like you don't need to do this anymore. Go take some chill job as an advisor to a startup working 20 hours a week so you have something to do and then fucking just chill. Like you're 42 years old. You still have the rest of your life ahead of you. Don't work this hard. Yeah. And uh, for sure. So, yeah, I mean, I think in general, the lesson to me, um, which one of my professors at school um, told me a long time ago and again stuck with me, is that our strengths are also our weaknesses. Right. So like if you're a chill, relaxed person, that can be a weakness. If you're a super driven person, that can be a weakness, too. So I think the key is to identify to always no matter who you are, I don't think there's any, you know, there's no right or wrong. You know, like you're you're not born right or wrong. Um, but the key, I think, is to always um, be practicing like self-awareness and int- introspection and ask like, Am I doing things that are going to contribute to my long-term happiness right now? And if not, how do I need to adjust? Am I, is my strength right now? Like for me, I always have to ask that that question of like, man, am I like, am I working harder than I need to? And it's not always, the answer to those questions is not always obvious, but I think you just always need to be ask, asking yourself those questions. Hmm. I think it goes back to what you're saying, because it's about just finding whatever your sort of purpose is, is sort of um, me- like sort of grand as that sounds like, because then if you're doing all of that work, it maybe doesn't feel like work if you're, because like these people yeah. are saying that feel over, maybe overworked or, well, maybe it's because, you know, if you're doing something for 12, 15 hours a day and you're not enjoying it, um, maybe your sort of not purpose, I don't mean like sort of God-given purpose, but like maybe the thing that you'll find fulfillment in at least isn't, it, it maybe deviates from that somewhat, you know. Um, yeah. It's a weird one because I, I look at that, you know, so I, I dropped out of uni to pursue music and was sort of, I guess, on the similar trajectory to, to my friends there um, and end up pursuing something else where I'm a lot more reliant on myself. You know, I'm, I'm self-employed at the moment and yeah. kind of just reliant on me. Um, what would you, in terms of finding that sort of intrinsic, like, motivation? Again, there'll be a lot of people because a lot of what you say will kind of make a lot of people uncomfortable, you know. Yes, um, I mean, will. in a good way. Um you know, um, well, a lot of people, I mean, listen, there's a lot of people that don't like me. Um, so I know that the way that I say things comes off as harsh. And that's another thing that 
you know, I try to work on because I don't want people to dislike me. And I know that the way I put things can be harsh to people. So, you know, whatever. But uh, so your question is like, how do you how do you find that? Yeah, finding the thing that excites you, you know, um, that you can actually then realistically make, you know, make into a career or yeah. some sort of. Well, remember, there's more to life than your career. You know, it's like you, you, there's uh, I think of it as sort of three legs of the of the the stool, I guess, because you can have a three legged stool. I don't know if maybe, maybe a four legged one is better, but we'll just say this is a three legged stool. You know, there's like your career, there's your physical and mental health and relationships. And all three of those things are important. But actually, I would say that like career is like the, the third priority for me, even though, you know, I talk about it a lot and think about it a lot. Um, for me personally, like relationships, like my family is the most important thing. I could have all the success in the world, but if it came at the cost of my wife and our son, then I would be miserable and it me it would mean nothing to me. You know, like think about how many like think about how many people in say Hollywood, you know, um have achieved all kinds of success. They're super wealthy and famous. Do they seem like happy people? Hmm. You know? I mean, I don't know them personally, so maybe they are. But you see these people with like a string of failed marriages and stuff and you know, having some kind of public freak out and I don't know. I think there's a lot more to life than having, you know, quote unquote success. Um, so that's number one. Just think about, you know, what actually makes you happy. And for some people, some people, you know, everyone's three legged school, everybody's three legged stool, three legged stool is going to look a little bit different. Um, but for me, priority number one is like family. Priority number two is my health. Because again, if like you don't have your health, then nothing else means anything and number three is career um so that's how i think of it and i think a lot of people especially like um this is going to be another statement that people aren't going to like but um uh, at least a lot of i'm assuming your audience is a lot of like young creative men um and and i know how these people think very very well i know i understand their minds better better than they understand them themselves I think that um, statement in themselves, they're going <laughs> to... They're not going to like it, but trust me. Trust me. I understand yeah. this. Um, they don't like being told what to do. They don't like being labeled. They want to think that, you know, they're all so unique and amazing and individual and nobody else is like me and you don't understand my life and blah, blah, blah. Well, let me ask you this. So I, there is a concept called Dharma in, um, uh, I guess I know it from Hinduism. It might be from somewhere else. I don't know. But um, I remember hearing this many, many years ago. Um, think so Dharma basically means like the path that you are, uh, you know, in, I'm not religious, but you know, they would say like that, that God has put you on, but I'll just, I'll, I'll say whether it's God or not, I don't know. But the, the way that it that this uh, person put it is like, think about it this way. Bees live in hives and they make honey. Um, beavers live in dams and build lodges and chew on sticks and whatever, you know, cows eat grass and they make milk and blah, blah, blah. So every other organism has a dharma. Why would you think that humans don't? Like, I think humans are maybe a little bit more complex than bees. So maybe like the range of possible paths might be broader. But um, I think a lot of people don't want to believe that the conventional wisdom might be true and that maybe having a normal job and a normal family and living in a normal place doing normal things. There's a reason why the vast majority of people are happy doing that. And um, you, you're probably, you're more, it's more likely that you are one of them than not. You might not be so special as you think. Um, and, and I say that because many times in my life, I thought that I knew better and I wouldn't listen. I thought the conventional wisdom was bullshit. And I thought, well, I'm no, I don't have to do things the way that everyone says. And I'm so different and special. Like everyone thinks this, but I know blah. You know, everyone thinks X, but I know Y. And again and again and again, I've been slapped in the face and confronted by reality that I don't know shit um, and that actually the conventional wisdom tends to be right. So um, I think it's very tempting to, to think that like they'll say, oh, I don't care about having a family. I just want to, it's just my music. That's all that matters to me. 
okay, I know that's how you feel right now, but you might change your mind, you know, um, at a certain point. And the, the thing that's scary is that there are what, you know, you could call like one way decisions, meaning that you've committed to something that has closed off other potential outcomes for you. So, you know, you're 40 years old and you spent, you know, your entire adult life committed to music. And then you realize that actually maybe this isn't what you want. It doesn't make you happy. And you've gone so far down this path because you sort of didn't ask yourself this question along the way of like, is this really what I want? And then having to like reboot your life at 40 years old is, uh, is scary and hard. So my advice for anybody is just be humble and question the things that you think you know. Because especially young men, we are fucking stupid and hard-headed and stubborn and we don't listen. Like We think we know it all. You can't tell us shit. So just question the things. If you're so certain, like I remember, so I'll, I'll give you a very real example of this. <laughs> um, do, uh, there's a thing called a varicose seal, which is basically like a varicose vein in your balls. And uh, I thought I had testicular cancer when I was like 25 or something because I felt this lump in my balls. I was like, oh, fuck, this is not good. So, like my heart, I was like traveling at the time and my heart like skipped a beat and my blood ran cold. And I was like, oh, fuck, I felt a lump in my balls. This is terrifying. And I had to wait like a week to get home and go to the doctor. And they felt and he was like, oh, no, this is just that's this isn't ball cancer. It's just a thing called a varicose seal. And I was like, oh, like, is it a big deal? And it's like, not really. Um, it might, you know, cause fertility problems for you when you're later or when you're older. And I was like, oh, whatever. I don't care. I don't want kids. And he's like, you might change your mind. And I was like, no, I'm sure I don't want kids. So. I don't care. And he's like, all right. And then fast forward many years later, um, when my wife and I decided we did want to have kids, I was like, oh shit, there's the, I've got that varicose seal. Am I going to be able to like, are we going to be able to have a kid? You know, like I thought, unfortunately it didn't create fertility problems for me, but it does for a lot of other people. So my point is there's a lot of things that, you know, at the age of 25, you're going to be so fucking certain of and convinced like, I'll always think this. Well, you're going to change your mind about a lot of those things. And probably a lot of those things will be in the direction of the conventional wisdom. I don't know. That's kind of a long answer, but I don't know if that helps at all. Yeah. On that note, what do you think in the next, say, bit of a difficult question, but if you had to hazard a guess as to how your mindset might change in say 20 years, what you might look back on at the age you're at now and think, oh, why did I think that? Or, you know, the, the way you're sort of addressing how, yeah. you know, say a 25 year old might be approaching family. Do you think there's something, if you had to hazard a guess as to what you might be approaching in a way that you think, I don't want to say you think you will regret. That sounds a little too... No, but what am I wrong about now? Yeah, if you have Nothing. To... I have it all figured out now. I used to be stupid, but now I'm brilliant and I know everything. Uh, I mean, that's... that. I mean, I don't know. Like, you don't... I don't know. Um, but if I had to guess, you know, probably I will look back and be like, you didn't have to work that hard. Yeah. I suppose it's a, if you're going to hedge your bets somewhere, I suppose betting on working hard... That's my thinking. Yeah. It's a difficult kind of um, dilemma. I think you're, you're told so much about what you should, like what you're talking about, where a sort of quote unquote normal life is, I think there are so many parts of normal life that that we should treasure, you know, that, that are important. Yeah. They're normal just because a lot of people have them. Just because a lot of people have it doesn't mean it's not valuable, you know. Like, right, exactly. Um, There's but, a reason why billions of people value family because it tends to make people happy. You know, everyone's different. Maybe family doesn't make you happy, um, but it probably will. So where do you think you fall on the uh, this kind of uh, sort of spectrum where you've got someone, say if you were to just live the most like median sort of life yeah. oh, I'm versus trying. the most extreme? Where, I'm trying. Yeah. Where, where, do you think you, where do you think you fall right now on that kind of on that scale um, of sort of an extreme, you know, uh, workaholic, kind of, not workaholic in a bad way, just working a lot, you know, um, well, versus- I mean, I more. fucked myself, like, so I fucked myself by making a lot of dumb decisions in my teens and 20s 
that um, made it so that for me to have, or should I say for our family to have sort of an unremarkable middle-class suburban lifestyle at this point in my life meant that I had to work really fucking hard to fix some of those stupid decisions. So, you know, people might look at our life now and be like, really? Like you had to work that hard for this? Like, well, yeah, because I made a lot of dumb choices. I remember um, when I was like 28 maybe or something, um, I so I didn't start college till I was 25. Um, that was dumb choice number one. Is when I was 18, I was like, oh, I don't need to go to college because I'm so smart and I'll just teach myself everything. Well, turns out, you know, after many years of unsuccessfully trying to get the jobs that I wanted and do the things that I wanted and just like having to like, you know, I lost out to these jobs to other people that like were more qualified than me, you know? And at the time I was like, oh, college is just a piece of paper. It doesn't mean anything. Well, turns out you actually do learn things in college and it does mean something. And there's a reason why people value it. It doesn't mean everything, but um, I was like, okay. Uh, and so I would say if anything, like maybe I just have a, a good trait of I'm not, I'm not like, afraid to admit when I was wrong. And so I, I was like 22 or 23 and I was like, okay, I made the wrong call there. I need to go to college better late than never. So I started when I was 25, but to make a long story short, because I was older and because of blah, 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 I had to take out a lot of loans for it. So I was like 28 or something. And I had like $90,000 in student debt, um, which that's a lot of fucking money. Um, and I, I was like really scary. I was like, fuck, how am I going to fucking pay all this off? And by the way, I paid it all off years ago um, ahead of time. But I was like, Shh, God damn it, this is scary. And so my goal was to have a net. And at the time, so all I had was $90,000 in debt for student loans and a couple thousand dollars in credit cards. So my net worth at that time was like negative $92,000 or something. Right. And I was like, my goal is by the age of 40 to have a net worth of zero. <laughs> and. You know, that like that sucks. Like you shouldn't have a net worth of zero at 40. Like that shouldn't be your fucking. And it was hard to even see how I would pull that off. You know, because like, how are you going to pay off ninety thousand dollars in 12 years? That's that's pretty fucking hard. Um, and I did. I did actually do it. I paid it off earlier than that. But um, I really dug myself into a hole by making a lot of these stupid decisions and thinking that I knew better and like that I was going to do things my way, you know, and every time I admit defeat and like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do things my way. Maybe I should do things their way. Then things work out better. Um, so where do I fall in that continuum now? I mean, we live, I mean, you can see the room behind me. We live in a fucking normal, boring, you know, house in the suburbs. That's, you know, whatever. There's nothing special about like our lifestyle at all. Um, and I'm like, that's all I ever wanted. You know, I grew up not like dirt poor, but like, you know, single mom on, uh, on welfare or I don't know, do they still call it the dole over there? Yeah. Yeah. You got to give it more attitude though. It's a dull. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm fascinated by, by, uh, what do you call, what do you call the like, people from like Wigan? Uh, oh, uh, from Wigan, yeah, those type uh, of people. Those... <laughs> it depends how much you want to offend people from Wigan, I guess. Um, <laughs> well, I'm fast. I'm fascinated by that. So I mean, there's. So I don't know if there's a thing for. I feel like Wigan. That there's a thing for like just people in like the north. I guess uh -huh. it's like well, it's just it's... northern. I mean, there's what, things what, like Scousers. Is that a different thing? Oh, okay. So Scousers are from like Liverpool. Liver okay, Liverpool. That's a little bit of a different thing. Yeah, and then. New people from Newcastle are Geordies. Okay. Um, yeah, I've seen Geordie Shore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's like this whole like, to me, it's all similar. Chavs, Scousers, oh, and Geordies. Chavs. Do you just think people are from Wigan are Chavs? Of, <laughs> yeah, they're all sort of related to me. I know they're different, but yeah. My what I was gonna say is I I, I want to channel that attitude. Oh, That's my okay. goal in life. You could probably do. You'd probably do well going to Wigan to to achieve that. I think. The, okay. The, a chav is just like I think it's the close. It's like the British version of a redneck, basically. I think right. is the. I think that's the. You know, it's um. I'm trying to think the best way. They're normally like on a street corner. The way that when I think of chav, it's like someone on a street corner, like probably 15 years old, like smoking and yeah. drinking, shouting at old people. Right. Um, right. You know, that's my stereotypical kind of. 
Yeah. I just, yeah, you could, if you want to channel that, like... That's so my it, goal. I just want to be a Wigan chap. <laughs> you can... That's all I ever wanted out of life. If you... Yeah, net worth zero <laughs> at 40 and Wigan <laughs> right. chap is a good... Yeah. There's not much... I mean, I don't know what else you would even add to that bucket list. Like I watch a lot of Danny Dyer, you know. <laughs> yeah. He's, so he's like, more cockney. fucking hell. He's, yeah, he's more cockney than he is... Um, I wouldn't say he's, he's not a chav, you know. They're all um, the same, but they're all the same to me because I'm I'm a foreign. Like there, it's all just all the lower class versions of 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 people from the UK to me are all the same, you know. There's there's definitely a common theme north to south of yeah yeah. Um, I, what was I going to say? Um, uh, yeah, he's more like Cockney, kind of or like governor kind of. Thing. Right, right, right. Um, I'm always he seemed told- like a right nice geezer. Yeah, yeah. But then you've got more like in Birmingham, you've got like your Peaky Blinders kind of, uh-huh. um, you know, there's some pretty terrible, I don't know if you've seen Peaky Blinders, some of the accents. Yeah, I, well, I have, I have like, not, I haven't watched it, but I'm familiar with it. Yeah. I can only do like moments of, but like um, even if you go to, I think it's the Liverpool, it, it's very close to Manchester, really, compared uh-huh. to, especially compared to, you know, like the whole of the US, um, how far apart some of your like cities are. Um but they could sound pretty different, you know. They don't really sound because that people similar. from the UK are, can can they could hear you say like five words and like, oh, he's from like Wingham upon Stoke or whatever. <laughs> Google Maps just got very confused. Yeah, but where do you think I'm from? I have no fucking clue. The only the only thing I can identify, the only British accent I can identify, is. Or, well, or, or maybe you're from there and I'm wrong. The only one I can kind of identify, which you sound like maybe sort of like, is uh, I know a guy from Bath and you sound a little bit like that. Yeah, it's Bath. It's like, yeah, yeah. They, they, that's like West Country. So my parents live near that sort of, they're probably like 40 minutes from Bath. Okay, so yeah. I, wasn't, I wasn't all wrong. Yeah, they, they all sound like pirates and they talk like this. Yeah, yeah. very like it, everywhere in the West of England and also Nolly, the East from of England. Bath. Yeah, Bath is more. If you, that just you just sound like me there. You just sound like normal. I'm generic Southern accent is what I am. Okay, like, um, like non-chav generic Southern uh-huh. accent. <laughs> do you, Do you remember uh, Monday.com? Do you know that company? No, they make like project management software. There was some YouTube ad with like this British girl in it, and I was looking at the comments, and it was just everybody <laughs> was like British people debating where she's from, based on her accent. Was she actually British or was she playing a British person? Oh, she definitely was, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, there's some pretty appalling. I didn't know. Do you watch The Boys? Uh, no. Oh. so Like Like I said, I have no hobbies or interests. So unless okay. unless it's something I can watch with my wife, it doesn't exist. Well, there was, there's a character, like one of the main characters. I thought he was Australian for ages, but he's, <laughs> he's meant to be English. It's just, he's just got the accent. I think he might be, I don't even know where he's from. Not England. If he's from England, that's appalling. I don't even know. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, so, like, in terms of, um, was he trying to? I suppose trying to get some sort of, uh, some sort of relevant. I don't know how to steer back from Britain to uh, Britain to some sort of relevance of. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting. It's interesting how different parts of Britain are. But um, I'm no expert. I've not even travelled. I've not even been to Scotland. So it didn't. I I was like I learned like a year ago. And correct me if I'm wrong about this, because maybe I maybe I am, but that people consider like Irish and Scottish accents to be a version of like the British accent. I'm like to me, they're two totally different things. But they're talking about the UK accents and that those being like related. Like I don't think Irish people and Scottish people. Well, they don't sound like each other either, but they don't sound anything like British people to me. It, yeah, no, I agree. I don't think they're the part of the same. I mean, but it's not as different as someone that's, say, from like Scandinavia and then they come right, to the right, UK. Right. And speak. You know, that's quite obviously a lot of people in Europe, when they learn English, they learn it with an American accent. Right. So, no, well, it would be, no people, no, 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 no. P- Americans do not have an accent. You have an accent. <laughs> like, if you look up the word car in the dictionary, it says C A R. It's not K A. <laughs> what? Yeah, but I car. Yeah, that's a northern. Yeah, and how? Yeah, but I suppose that's more like K A. There's an R. It's not K A. C A R. 
Yeah, but then you guys say, um, yeah, but then you guys say aluminum. Well, there's, but that's not an accent. That's just like different. Yeah, but there's, a, there's, it's a, aluminium. It's an I U M at the end. So where are you getting um from at the end without the e? Well, no, okay, we're wrong on that one. That's <laughs> correct. That? I agree with you on that one. One all, yeah. In but football, like in football you want terms. a bottle of water? <laughs> yeah, I mean that is one. Like, yeah. what is that? Oh, bottle. Where did it, all the R's go? You missed. You missed the R. It, bottle or water? You want Bot a bottle of water? <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to think what other. There's lots of really dumb like town names in uh, in the UK, like really weird, especially actually near where my parents live. Like just really odd names. Although I suppose you guys, it's a big enough country. I'm sure some weird places. I got in like trouble. Blue once. balls, Pennsylvania. <laughs> well, I am. Um, I remember I managed to rack up a bit of a phone bill because I I prank called one of those like. Do you know it's it was one one eight? It's a very British thing, but it's like a um, uh, you, it used to be like what you'd call essentially before Google was a thing. You would call them and ask them to find you, yeah, like right. some yeah. connect you with some sort of four one one here, same thing. Probably yeah. And I I rang them up and asked them for like directions to Bell End or something. <laughs> and it, it's a real place. It's actually really close to where I am right now. Um, oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, there's a, it's it's a it's a legit place. Didn't even so the guy. But the funny thing was, I think I I racked up like quite a lot of money because it's one of those paid phone calls. You can't just call them for free. Uh -huh. you know, that's how they make their money. Um, and then I was trying to find the Bell End. Well, there's there's also there's a pub there was a pub near where I used to live called the Cock Inn. That's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> so, cock in and bell end would be a good combination. Yeah, there's a lot of weird British places. But yeah, I got I could hear the guy on the end of the phone. I could hear people laughing in the background. Uh, so, I could, but he didn't get it. I don't think he was English, uh -huh. so I don't think maybe he was aware of why that was so funny. Um, so yeah, that was my. Yeah, I was trying to navigate this somehow into business, some sort of business. I was going to ask you about. Um, well, I'll of, tell you why I am. You, you people might be asking yourself well, why are you watching videos about wigan and chavs and all these yeah you say you don't have things. time for things and then you know all about this well this was years ago for one but also i watch this stuff with my wife because she likes geography um but a, a big part of the reason why i watch stuff like that is because i think there's so much to learn or so much that you can you know by studying other people that you don't know anything about and just getting exposed to other points of view and lifestyles and things like that I think that's really valuable. And so many people go through life. I mean, especially now that YouTube exists, there's like a, a show called Somewhere Street that's really good. It's from like Japanese TV, but it's all been subtitled. And it's just like they'll go to some random city. I don't know, like all over the world, like some small town in Monaco or something like that, you know, on the outskirts of Monaco and like walk around for an hour, just like going to shops and talking to people and stuff. You know, it's like a POV cam kind of thing, stuff like that. And I just, you can learn so much about the world from that and then learn, you know, you'll learn about yourself that way too, because you'll compare the way that you think and act and whatnot to the way that other people do. And I think that's a really valuable way of kind of challenging your own beliefs and assumptions, which to me is like a very important thing. It's like really, really, really make sure that you believe this thing that you believe for a reason. Because if you really poke on a lot of things that you believe, if you get to the bottom of it, there's like one assumption. Like, I believe this because this, because this, because this, because this. And then you get to the very bottom of it and you're like, okay, that's the first principles, like foundation of everything else that I believe. Is that true? Hmm. How do you, uh, in terms of challenging, obviously the difficult thing about challenging your beliefs is you have to be aware of the fact you believe the fact that you've sort of constructed this belief yeah. through probably a lot of things that, that have been imposed on you by your parents or society or right. school or whatever right. um so the this the almost the pre step 1 of just being aware of that is quite difficult i've i've sort of um i feel like i've been become quite acutely aware of the fact that a lot of the things especially with the way the internet is nowadays it's so easy to think that your beliefs are so like uh sort of self-generated and um mm -hmm, uh, right. authentic when the chances yep. are like i i believe a similar thing to probably a combination of what my mom and dad believe you know um and probably. then what, probably <laughs> what i picked up through school and that yeah. um and you know well, none of us are as special as we probably think we are 
Yeah, it's a bit like that Monty Python. Speaking of Britain, that Monty yeah. Python uh, Life of Brian was like, you're all unique. And they all go, right, right. Yeah, we're all unique or whatever they say. I can't remember. I probably should know well, that just, thing of Brit. I think just keep asking why you believe something. For example, um, I believe that um, I like, so let's, let's say, for example, on Monday night, um, I was working until maybe I got up at like 4.30 to feed our son and whatnot. I was working until maybe 9.30 p.m. at night. And so it's like 9 p.m. and I was working on whatever I was working on. Why am I doing that at the moment? Like, well, it's I got to do this right now. Well, why do you have to do this? Well, because if I don't do this, then the following thing will happen in our business. Um, and that's bad because this, because this, because this. And at the end of it, what it comes down to is that um, I believe, I feel like at any time, my whole life could come crashing down and I will end up penniless. And if I am penniless, then um, my life, my wife will leave me and I will be alone for the rest of my life. And if I'm alone for the rest of my life, then I will be miserable and uh, I'd rather be dead. Like that's fundamentally at the, at, at the, the core of it, that's how I feel and what I believe. Now, you can already start thinking to yourself, you're like, oh, well, you're making a lot of assumptions there that probably aren't actually true, right? Or they might be true, but they might not be. You know, there's a lot of things there that are sort of irrational beliefs on my part, right? Hmm. I, I know. Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose even knowing that maybe you don't understand yourself as well as you think is part of that process, I guess. Yeah, um, like, right. for example, you know, let's say that... Um, you know, so I have another, I have a company that I run aside from YouTube, but let's just pretend that YouTube is my only job. Um, if my channels got deleted tomorrow and my income went to zero, um, like that idea fills me with panic because then I'm like, oh, well then nobody's going to hire me because of this, this, and this, and I'm going to have to work at, you know, McDonald's for the rest of my life. Well, that's not true. Right, like that's how I feel, but that's not true. Hmm. I, I, I've got. It's, I can kind of relate in that. Like I um, wasn't even that long ago. Like I quite like. I've said to a few people, I quite value just spending time with my friends, you know, and um, and normally because I have a lot of music musician friends. Normally that's Friday, Saturday evening, you know, and obviously that's just yeah. people off work and stuff. Um, I remember there's one evening where like no one was around and no one, like none of my sort of friends were particularly available, you know. Um, I felt quite uncomfortable. I was like, oh, I just want to do something, you know. Um, and on the surface, that's just a like, you can you can just put that down to, oh, I just want to go and I just want to go and enjoy myself. But then, well, why yeah. why do I need to go? Why do I need to yeah. go and see all my friends? Or what? And it probably comes down to the fact I don't really like being on my own, you know. I think I'm right. quite an extroverted right. person. I like to be around people. And I don't like that idea of not having people around or not. Or, or, it's, it's maybe and going. Why don't, why don't you like that? Why, that's that's a good question. Um, is it because you're it's boring? So the is it the belief that if I'm by myself, I'm going to be bored? Is it if I'm by myself, that means nobody likes me? Like what is the? It's probably more the nobody likes me thing. It's the it's it's yeah. um it's difficult because I don't know <clears throat> it truthfully. You know, it's definitely not boredom. It's not that. Like I can okay. be on my own. You know, I can I can. So it's obviously something more. Um, you know, but I, I don't. I think it, it probably does stem from you know the same t in the same way. I, for example, I'm working on my vocals. Like I play guitar. You see me over there, behind yeah. me. Um, and I'm quite nervous about the idea of putting out myself singing. I'm okay. I'm right. Not I'm not terrible. I know I'm not terrible. Um, and I was like, well, why am I? I asked this question myself. I was like, well, why am I afraid of putting out my vocals or like get being heard singing in the rehearsal room or something? Yeah. And it's like, well, I guess I'm worried people will laugh at me or something. I'm worried. That, and then I think like, well, why am I worried they laugh at me? And Because yeah. that doesn't really matter, does it? And then I'm like- And also, you know, is anyone actually going to laugh at you? No. But even well, if the they other, did, yeah. even if they did, would that really be so bad? Mm. Yeah. I've been, I've been trying to do quite a lot of digging with that. It's sort of, uh, you know, find out for myself why. And so the core is. of that is fear of judgment. Yeah. You know, and- and I, again, like as, as you have heard, like I, I fully acknowledge that I have tons of like irrational beliefs and fears and stuff. Like I'm not saying I'm some sort of perfectly rational person that 
has their shit all figured out and like whatever. Um, my overall point here is I think it's just helpful for all of us to like understand what those things are so that when you feel those things taking control of you, that's, that's when the bad shit happens. You know, when you let those, like when you let the little voice in your head steer you into taking action based on fear, that's when the bad things oftentimes happen Hmm. and a fear or, um, pursuit of any other sort of irrational thing um which is almost always related rooted in fear like think about like celebrities um uh celebrities that do all kinds of crazy shit like what was the one i was just thinking about the other day um there was somebody who oh, fuck who was it there was somebody who was acting like just a fucking complete fool on some reality program i don't remember who it was but this person was already famous and rich and I was like, why are you doing this? Like, you don't need to do this. And I'm sure if we dug deep enough, it's probably because, you know, they feel like unless they're getting attention from strangers, that that they're, you know, somehow that their self-worth is in, in jeopardy, right? Mm. And so my point is when we listen to these sort of irrational voices in our head, which is almost always rooted in fear – that's when the bad shit happens. Do you think there's any sort of, cause you know, it can, we're talking about Karen stick. It can motivate you, but I, I try in terms of thinking of healthy, it can motivate you into some sort of forward momentum, but whether that yeah. forward momentum is actually fixing any inherent problems, I don't exactly. know if you're motivated by a fear of something like, it's like exactly. the typical one is comedians, right? That, 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 that desire to be, I suppose when you flip it, the fear of not being right. liked or loved or felt right. appreciated. The comedians, but it's like the front, it's the typical front man, front woman thing, isn't it? It's like that yes. need to be adored or whatever. Exactly, um, because it's not going to fix it. You can have a million, literally a million people telling you that you're great and amazing and wonderful and you're the most important thing in the world, blah, blah, blah. But if you don't love yourself and you don't accept yourself, all that praise from them is not going to make you happy. Hmm. It's a tricky. It's not going to, you know, and like if you're afraid of being poor, you could have a billion dollars in the bank. You're still going to be scared. So how do you kind of square that? Um, you know, you talk right at the beginning about, uh, action what was the exact phrase um uh esteem comes from so uh, action uh, action leads to self self-esteem i think yeah so how do you create like positive action to create self-esteem that isn't driven by that you know fear. by that yeah fear? so i think you need to paint a picture of what will truly make you happy not avoiding fear i mean I, you know i guess it's it's okay to do that to some extent but Paint a picture of what will actually make you happy and you don't know what will make you happy until you are really honest with yourself and understand to what extent you're sort of letting fear boss you around, right? So you might say, well, I'll be happy if I'm rich and famous and I have millions of fans, but will you really? So you got to really understand yourself of what's going to make you happy. For example, I know that what makes me happy is having a stable, calm family life that's what makes me happy at the end of the day um really that's like the only thing that makes me happy like or put it this way nothing makes me happy unless i have that and then that's like the foundation of everything so i optimize for that yeah i think that's a, and, and, and i don't think there's any sort of uh when when someone says to you they feel happy because they've got a family, I don't think anyone goes, oh, you're just terrified of not having a family. I think pe pe it's recognized, like you talk about the sort of conventional yeah. wisdom, it's recognized, I think, as sort of a, a family, is sort of an institution that makes, generally makes life better. I mean, that's it's just a good biology, family. right? Like we're driven to read, that's our dharma. You know, we're driven to reproduce, to continue the species. Like our brain makes the happy chemicals when you create offspring and, you know, build a safe environment for them so they don't die. And then your brain makes happy chemicals that says, yeah, good job. You're continuing the species. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, I mean, we're all just wet machines at the end of the day. That makes me think of a question that I asked 
it was a would you <laughs> it's one of those would you rathers it was in one of the last podcasts and it was would you rather be constantly damp or constantly vibrating oh fuck um <laughs> pretty well, shitty yeah uh... th- that's scary because uh for a while i had uh tremors oh, okay um, and so i had to um i had to confront the possibility of being constantly vibrating for the rest mm-hmm. of my life and that was f- scary as fuck yeah that was the scariest time in my entire life yeah I mean, so I don't want to take too much of your time, but that's sort of an in, interesting that you just quickly you talk about sort of a scarier time in your life. How do you kind of, uh, you know, how do you deal with fear? I mean, we talked about it, you know, it doesn't have to be like existential fear, but just, you know, um, there's a final sort of question and then we can, and I'll get your well, questions. Well, there's two kinds of, there's two kinds of fears. There's fears over things that are real and things that aren't. And um, dealing with fear of things that aren't real, you know, for example, nobody likes me. Um, I'm going to be alone the rest of my life, blah, blah, blah. That's all imaginary. None of that's not that's that's made up. And so, like, to me, that's like if you feel f- fearful, I'm like, OK, what are you actually afraid of? What is real? What's actually happening that you're afraid of? And you're like, oh, well, my friend didn't return my phone call. Therefore. He doesn't like me. Therefore, nobody likes me. Therefore, I'll be alone the rest of my life. Therefore, I'll be miserable forever. Therefore, I might as well just die right now. Okay, but let's back up. What actually happened is your friend didn't return your call, probably because he's busy with something else or he just forgot. So let's just ground ourselves in reality. Now, there's another type of fear of shit that is real. For example, you go to the doctor and they say you have a lump in your balls. That is scary as fuck, um, but that's a different type of fear. That um, that's a different type of fear. You know, the first kind of fear is irrational, and for that, you can look up. There's a thing called CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and you can look up. There are basically different types of distorted thinking, um, different patterns of distorted thinking, like catastrophizing, black and white thinking, projection, blah blah blah. You can look them up. I would suggest anybody like print out a list of like CBT distortions and you will notice those in your thinking and that will help you once you identify like i'm trapped in this distortion right now it's kind of like um did you ever watch naruto no um so there's like illusion magic in there called genjutsu where one of the characters says genjutsu of that level doesn't work on me um genjutsu yeah (laughs) when you notice that you're like exactly i wish i could say it like that but i can't but when you're when you're trapped, you recognize that you're trapped in this illusion. It's easier to kind of break out of it. Um, the second type of you know when you're afraid because of something that's actually real. The way I think of it, for me, I'm, I don't know if this works for everybody, but I think of like what is the worst case scenario here that's likely to happen, and then once I deal with that, I'm like, okay. So for example, I had tremors like in one of my hands for a while. Um, and, uh, to make a long story short it's because of some medication that I was on at the time, but it took about a year for that to sort of become apparent. And I was like, all right, well, what if I have to live with this for the rest of my life? Um, what if my left hand has tremors bad enough that I can't really use it? Could I get through life having, you know, uh, one hand that doesn't work very well? I guess that wouldn't be ideal, but it's not the end of the world. You know, I talked to one of my friends. Uh, do you know the band, The Ghost Inside? Yeah. So, you know, I, I know the drummer of that band who lost his leg. And I asked him about this, you know, and he gave me a lot of really good advice about like, look, I just like I had to deal with the fact that I don't have a fucking leg anymore. Here's how I think about it. And I was like, all right. So life goes on, you know. Um, Now, if you're getting a terminal cancer diagnosis, you can't say life goes on, but I don't know how to deal with that. But I'm sure there's like grief specialists that will help you deal with that. But um, I know this is a really long answer, but for most of us, the things we're afraid of aren't real. So just think about what's real, like push aside all the like bullshit cobweb illusions and just focus on what's real. And if it's actually, if you're dealing with something scary that is real, it's okay to be scared about that. If you have a lump in your balls 
or, you know, you had to get your leg amputated, like totally cool to be freaked out about that. But that's pretty rare. Hmm. Yeah, well, they say that it's sort of man suffers more in imagination, don't they? Let's see. Um, exactly. Can't remember exactly. Who said that. Someone smarter than me. Probably wasn't exactly. from Wigan or anywhere in England. <laughs> um, Danny Dyer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I like those historical quotes that like blatantly <laughs> aren't by the person. It's always Abraham Lincoln that gets it, isn't it? Like, um, or Gandhi or someone. So it'll just be like. I'm a Ross Kemp guy. He's he's my um, he's going to be my historical quote source from now on. I like him. So to redeem your for any Wiganites, we can uh-huh. call them that, um, who now hate you. How mm-hmm. who is your favorite? What's your favorite thing about Britain? Who's your favorite donk. British person? Huh? Donk. Do you remember that song? Put a donk on it. Blackout Crew. <laughs> no. Oh, you got to look that one up. That's great. You'll love it. I so, believe they're from Wigan. So that's your favorite thing about this entire country? No. Uh, the Brexit voters don't like you right now either. <laughs> you really? Well, I, I would have thought that those people would be Brexiters. But what, the people that don't like you? Or no, Wigan? no, like Wigan people, I would have thought they would be Brexiters. I don't know. Or do they just not care? <laughs> I don't know. I cannot speak on their behalf. I, I, I can probably speak on their behalf, say that they're less fond of you as of now, but that's that's fine. There's probably people. I bet you, well, who knows, but I'm pretty sure I'm the only American that has like spoken on behalf of Wigan ever. <laughs> you might be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so your favorite thing about Britain is what, sorry, the the song Chavs, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Chavs. We'll go I'll go with Chavs. Okay. Cool, nice one. I'm sure. I'm sure that's fixed everything. Just maybe. Yeah. Just be careful when walking down the street in Wigan, or I think you need to be careful anyway, actually. But <laughs> right. Particularly, I was, I was already planning on that. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, Wigan. Right to finish up. So I need a question to start my next conversation with my next guest. So like an opener, like you had, it can be whatever you I like. I got to think of something clever here. The pressure's on. Mm-hmm. Um. So how about um, uh. How about, well, I'll do another would you rather. Okay. Um, would you rather, uh, would you rather, hmm, hmm, hmm. gosh. Uh, These are always difficult because you always want to come up with the best would you rather you've ever heard. Exactly, exactly. Um, and I'm not going to. Um, so would you, oh, no, no, here's a question. Here's a question. Um, okay. If you cloned yourself and then... Um, and then gave your clone a hand job. <laughs> is that gay or is it masturbation? <laughs> I've got to ask this to someone. I don't even know who I'm asking this to. Okay, well maybe don't ask on that one then. <laughs> Was give me give me some sort of I like the cloning theme because I've had so I've had one question where I asked it and I thought about it as like I cannot someone's given me an hour okay. of their time. So if the you one, cloned yourself and then punched the clone in the face. Okay. Um is that um is that assault or self harm? It's still dark, but <laughs> okay, it's it's better, I guess. Yeah. Okay, let's try again. Let's try again. <laughs> if we're you going in yourself, the right direction. <laughs> okay, if you cloned yourself and um and oh, how about this? Okay, let's say um if if you cloned yourself at work and made and gave the clone a promotion. Um. Is that an HR violation? <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, that that I can I can do. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. if not, why not? Or I could just combine. Explain all your of, answer. I could combine all of them. If your you know if your clone jerks off in the workplace, and there you, you go, you punch the clone because it did that. Is that an but HR violation? But you're 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 you are the clone's <laughs> HR supervisor. So can you punch the clone? <laughs> That's the question. Right. Um. Yeah. No, I had to ask someone. Uh, and then this is when I decided I am going to veto some questions because he asked, and I did ask the person. It was like, I think it was, if you had to make dick molds out of your friends to use as like coat hangers, which friends would you pick? Or something <laughs> along those lines. And I asked that and I was like, I can't believe I asked someone that. So from now on, I'm like, there's a line where I'm just going to go, okay, I can't. Well, I gave you some options. You, you can did. pick and choose whatever works for your next guest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll, I'll decide whether the other question, yeah, I'll... <laughs> Awesome. Um, if you've got like an artist you think deserves some love, it'd be cool to share share them. With like the a musician? Yeah. Well, to be fair, anyone anyone you think deserves a bit of recognition, you know, if we can 
Give them a shout out. Um, I, you know what? People may already know about this. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. But uh, I will throw out um, the Dada movement. Okay. Very ahead of their time. Like uh, Marcel Duchamp. You know, he was the one that you've, you, the most famous thing he probably did was he put a toilet in an art gallery. And this is like in like 1910, maybe like a very, very like over 100 years ago when that doing that was like very revolutionary is basically a way to just say this whole fine art scene is fucking stupid. Look, I'm going to put a toilet in this gallery. New people are going to take it seriously. And they did. And he was brilliant. It's like, have you seen the Always Sunny episode where Frank is uh the, the art director. Have you seen that one? No. Or do you watch it? I've never seen oh, no, because you don't. I, oh, I know okay. what it is, but I've never seen it. I'm giving you American If you, if you have questions about love and hip hop, I can answer them. Uh, any, any sort of like reality TV, I can probably answer those questions. Or HGTV, because I can watch those two things with my wife. What's HGTV? Home and Garden TV. So like <laughs> the all the house flipping shows and stuff. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, yeah, I always, there's always something quite, satisfying about those i love it i love that we watch those all they're all the same it's just like they go to like they have to pick you know this couple is moving to this place and they have to pick from these three houses which one are they going to pick it's all the same it's just like whether it's in you know the beach or the mountains or the city or whatever but they're all they're all the same show and we watch all of them oh you know this is a funny thing i was watching uh what was i watching Oh, was my ex made me watch something or other. It was some sort of reality show where like, they, I think it was like Married at First Sight or one of those kind of things. Uh-huh. And the guy that was on it, um, he was like, he was quite strange. He was kind of, it was nice. He was just a bit weird, you know, which is fine, I guess. Um, but then I was scrolling through Instagram and he works at like a guitar store. I don't know uh-huh. where, but it just it's him holding a guitar. I'm like, what the fuck? Where's this guy come from? Um, and he was, and I've, the only time I'd seen him before that was like on TV on a date like a first date or something it's really weird um so yeah that's that's that for another british moment um it's just to finish up is there anything you want to promote plug to the world uh just everyone go look up uh put a donk on it by blackout crew <laughs> um and it will help you understand uh it'll help you understand world uh the world wigan and yourself it sounds like a book i think <laughs> self-help very- book put a donk on it put a donk on it awesome I don't know if I just said something offensive. I don't know. Maybe. No. Cool. The donk is just the sound. It goes donk, da donk, donk, donk. Oh. <laughs> right. On that note, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>